because it was Just letting people filter in. Uh, we'll start momentarily. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if people are still filtering in. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, and welcome to uh, our first California webinar about new um, federal uh, federal programs for, for walking and biking, and in particular, the state Safe Streets for All program, um, and its particular relevance for California communities. Um, my name is Jonathan Matz. I'm California Senior Policy Manager for the Safe Routes Partnership, and I'm happy to be with you here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll quickly go through duplicate information. Um, before or, or I'll go ahead and introduce uh, my co presenter uh, today, Stephen Hanamika. Hanamika from Hanamika. Um, sorry, I just realized I forgot the last. I and her name, Stephen. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I will go ahead and fix it on the slide that gets distributed. Uh, he's the transportation planning uh, manager for the San Luis Obispo uh, Council of Governments, um, which is uh, the MPO up uh, in in um, I say up because I'm in Los Angeles, up in San Luis Obispo, uh, in San Luis Obispo, and there he um, he leads uh, Slow Cog Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Program. Um, he's worked in the field of, of regional transportation planning for almost 10 years, um, with stops in Salt Lake City um, and in Modesto um, before he landed in his current position um, in San Luis Obispo. Um, and there uh, in the uh, in Slow Cog's programming and project delivery division, uh, Stephen works closely with community members and local agency partners to identify, scope, fund, develop, and deliver transportation projects, uh, including highway, transit, and bicycle and pedestrian projects. Um, and in his free time, you can catch him riding on uh, Highway 1 um, and struggling as he makes his, or he says struggling, I'll have to take his word for it as he makes his way up local street <laughs> roads. Um, a little bit about us at uh, the Safe Routes Partnership. Sorry, went a little bit too high, uh, ahead on that. Um, our mission is to advance safe walking and rolling uh, to and from schools and um, everyday life, uh, improving the health and well being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities uh, for everyone. Um, our organization began that work with schools in mind. And over time, we've realized that. Um, What's good for getting kids safely to school on foot and bike is good for moving people of all ages throughout our communities to all kinds of everyday uh, destinations, including parks, um, grocery stores. Um, and so we've expanded our own uh, mission and, and knowledge and resource sharing to include uh, those destinations. A little bit about what brings us here today. Um, as some of you may know and have attended uh, the California um, policy program at Safe Arts Partnership, um, has been conducting uh, webinars about the active transportation program as part of our broader portfolio of technical assistance for the ATP uh, since 2019. I think we started doing that. Um, and uh, it's in that spirit that we also wanted to uh, bring some attention to California uh, uh, agencies and practitioners. There's been new resources coming out of Washington, D.C., not so new at this point, but a couple years old um, coming out from the, the bipartisan bipartisan infrastructure law, and in particular, how um, those can be used in tandem um, with uh, uh, efforts to get some funds from some of the competitive programs here in California, most most notably ATP. Um, so it was in that spirit that um, we actually reached out to Stephen, who um, we're working with on uh, technical assistance for the ATP, and who has also been successful 
in this uh, SS4A Straight Streets for All program, and um, we're uh, actually seeing the benefits as as we work together this year in um, and the the synergy between um, those two programs as well. So um, we'll be able to talk about um, uh, how to um, how to be uh, using them in, in tandem. Um, so a little bit about some of the discretionary grant programs, um, which are new from USDOT. Um, since the beginning of the Biden administration, in particular, this one that we're talking about today, streets, uh, safe streets and road for all, uh, roads for all. Um, as we sent in the reminder announcement uh, for this webinar, um, along uh, along the way in planning uh, what we're doing today, we um, realized that this program is actually so expansive, we're going to focus on one particular subset of it. Um, uh, this morning, in particular, the planning and demonstration grants, or what used to be called the action plans and supplemental action plans. Safe Streets and Roads for All also has uh, the implementation grants, infrastructure grants. Um, to try to capture them all in one webinar, we realized it was biting up a little bit more than, than we could chew or, or talk about today. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about uh, the planning and demonstration uh, grants, but I'll just give you a little bit of an overview. Very similarly to ATP, you can you can apply um, uh, to do both to to plan or to implement infrastructure. Um, but uh, where there's particular opportunity, we think with safe streets and roads for all is um, in um, planning, in which uh, um, uh, the just general availability. Um, of those funds uh, is uh, much greater for communities. Uh, implementation has uh, shown itself to be a much more competitive uh, pot of funds, uh, very similar um, to uh, to how competitive uh, ATP has been um, over the uh, over the years for for California communities. Um, so the purpose of Safe Streets and Roads for All is something that I think will be familiar to to, to most people and consistent with the kinds of things that you're working on. But it's for it's for vision zero um, and towards zero deaths uh, type infrastructure, um, safe walking and biking infrastructure, obviously um, safe routes to school programs and just in general, um, uh, head bike improvements, all consistent with that. Um, $5 billion total over, over five years um, and eligible applicants, also quite similar to the California uh, competitive programs, local um, tribal governments, MPOs, transit agencies, 40% uh, of the overall funding in straight, safe streets and roads for all goes to um, goes to support communities and developing plans, um, and 60% goes to actually implementing um, some of those strategies in in, um, in building out infrastructure. Um, the notice of funding opportunity was uh, already a couple months ago, and applications are due on July 10th of this year. Um, the good news is, if you're um, really sort of getting up to speed with us uh, today um, and uh, see a deadline that's in, you know, uh, a month and a half, uh, fear not uh, the, the application process, at least for these planning grants, is um, considerably uh, more straightforward than, for example, the active transportation program. Uh, so you're, you're definitely uh, not too late. Stephen's going to be talking a little bit about the actual, his experience actually applying uh, successfully um, but um, you're you're still uh, in uh, with enough time to to get an application in um, and and set yourself up for some uh, for some exciting planning uh, opportunities. Um, so just quickly, uh, we're going to be focusing on the sort of light blue uh, bars that you see on your screen uh, right now about um, about an act, uh, a, a setting up a planning and demonstration grant. Um, but this is uh, how USDOT. Um, uh, segments applicants into the, the different um, categories of um, uh, safe streets for all uh, grants. Um, and um, uh, so we will be doing a subsequent webinar on those implementation grants uh, at a date to be determined. Um, but the, the planning grants that we're going to be talking about today is if you either don't have an action plan, um, some sort of vision zero or safe routes to school plan, or just a, a bike pad master plan, something like that, to develop one of those, or if you have such a plan but want to do a little bit more sort of uh, um, project specific planning, um, maybe test out um, some supplemental planning and, and get things a little bit uh, closer to, to being ready for an infrastructure grant. There's also a category of these SS4 grants 
for supplemental planning as well. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about those in the kind of back half of, of our webinar uh, presentation today. Um, so those uh, in general, what, what you'll see up there are the general um, uh, uh, range of um, uh, funding that's anticipated um, for uh, the two categories of grants. Um, and uh, USUOT anticipates um, awarding at least $250 million for the demonstration activities, um, part of it uh, within a, a broader 40% um, uh, for, for planning. So again, that's, that's going to be for the, the second half uh, supplemental, um, supplemental planning uh, grants. Uh, the USUOT expects about a quarter of a billion dollars or at least I should say a quarter of a billion dollars to go to that specific type of, of planning grant. Um, and here is how USDOT um, is, um, is distinguishing between uh, the two kinds of planning and demonstration grants, uh, creating an action plan versus a supplemental action uh, plan. So as you can see, um, action plan um, in general is, is a little bit of a higher level uh, type thing. Um, so, uh, um, uh, it's it's a it's what the it's what USDOT terms a comprehensive safety action plan, um, and uh, the the components that you'll see listed in bullet points a little bit more about what some of those mean. Uh, leadership commit commitment and goal setting. Um, uh, so that would uh, that would involve uh, coming up with a, a timeline um, and leadership process for eliminating roadway facilities and serious uh, serious industry um, serious injuries. Um, setting up a planning structure um, that would be charged with with oversight of the action plan development, uh, implementation, and and monitoring. So uh, the funds to to create um, maybe a, a uh, an interjurisdictional uh, committee if you're if you're an MPO or a COG uh, or uh, various kinds of of, of neighborhood teams. Um, but the the SS four A action plan grants could help in your um, your bringing that that body together, um, an analysis of existing conditions and historical trends and safety analysis, um, you know, providing a, a baseline level of crashes um, involving fatalities and serious injuries um, across your jurisdiction or your uh, locality or, or tribal, uh, tribal jurisdiction. Um, uh, and then uh, engagement and, and collaboration uh, with stakeholders Private sector community groups um, allowing for, for for community representation and, and feedback, and then finally uh, equity considerations um, developed uh, through the plan as well. Um, some of what uh, is in the supplemental planning uh, grant category, the kind of demonstration activities. This would be if you have already a com a comprehensive safety action plan on the books. And you want to um, go a little bit further in detail in specific parts of it. So some feasibility uh, studies, um, uh, including quick builds uh, and uh, some, some engineering studies, maybe uh, uh, evaluating um, uh, evaluating feasibility and appropriateness uh, for uh, different kinds of traffic signals or high visibility crosswalks, um, various bike lane uh, bike lane treatments. Um, pilot programs uh, for educational campaigns or uh, potentially even uh, speed safety programs um, and um, um, uh, anything that could um, demonstrate safety benefits of technologies that are maybe new to your community but haven't yet been um, yet been adopted like uh, adaptive signal timing as I mentioned before uh, speed cameras or or variable speed limits or adaptive lighting really sort of uh, temporary by nature uh, improvements um, that are looking at really refining the details of some of the projects that may be listed as a high level interaction plan. Um, and then um, as well, um, taking the time to, to evaluate um, how these, these projects went um, um, uh, from a from an engineering standpoint in terms of uh, 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 monitoring speeds or crashes, as well as, of course, uh, community feedback on on um, which uh, which improvements uh, were were best received and and uh, and most favored by the community. 
So um, uh, these are the, um, the requirements that any action plan uh, that, um, that uh, you did funded by SS4A uh, were to have. Um, uh, so um, uh, I'll quickly go through here, um, showing it on this, the slide in this case, um, as I mentioned before, feasibility studies. Um, and um, these are all listed out as well on the uh, streets, uh, Safe Streets for All uh, um, website. And we're gonna be pointing you towards that with some of webinars as well that, that they've run um, from USDOT. Uh, but these will be the deliverables um, that you'll be um, that you'll be turning into a USDOT uh, if your action plan is is funded. Um, and uh, with that, I am going to uh, hand it over to this and the second page. Uh, I won't read through all of it, um, but we'll have it in our slides here. Um, but I'll hand it over to Stephen, uh, who will talk. Uh, a bit about how um, uh, uh, Slow Cog decided to go for one of these and, and how um, how they're using it um, in um, in the underserved area of of, uh, of Oceano. So, Stephen, all great. Thank you, Jonathan. We'll do a little merry-go-round here and switch it up. <clears throat> Tell me if you're seeing the right thing, Jonathan. Okay. Um, all right. My name is Stephen Hanamaikai, a transportation planner with Slow Cog, as Jonathan mentioned. And I'll share a little bit about um, <clears throat> how we ended up applying as the MPO for a Safe Streets for All action plan, and a little bit about what we're doing uh, in Oceano. Um, so I work as a planner in the project uh, programming and delivery division. So we're always looking towards uh, how are we going to implement things. Uh, and of course, that includes most, almost always, um, some, some grant funding. Um, ahead of the cycle one call for projects, or, or NOFO rather, for the SS4A grant, we surveyed our uh, member agencies uh, to get baseline understanding of where they stood and what what whether or not they thought uh, through their existing analysis and plans and policies whether they uh, would qualify for an implementation grant and we found that the majority of them almost all of them <clears throat> had uh, qualifying safety plans um, which must include um, you know, an analysis of the existing conditions um, involving fatal and serious injury collisions, um, an, anal an analysis of, of where those crashes occurred and the contributing factors, as well as sustain systemic safety analysis, looking at uh, high risk roadway features and other um, relevant uh, for, you know, the, the safety needs for relevant road users. Um, a lot of those plans were actually funded through Caltrans, um, through their uh, Highway Safety Improvement Program. Uh, there was a high priority in having uh, systemic safety analyses or local road safety plans um, in order to qualify for, for HSIP, uh, I believe, starting already. Uh, so a lot of the plans were done. Uh, you know, the projects have been selected and the, the those um, those different analyses were uh, adopted within the, the adequate timeline. Um, so each of those three here on the left, uh, in order for you to qualify for an implementation grant must be um, um, uh, verified uh, through a, a self-assessment. Uh, but you also need to have at least uh, four of the remaining six elements there on the right of a, a leadership commitment or goal uh, to uh, reach a vision zero or establishing a vision zero goal vision zero goal um, or you know other uh, uh, sort of sig significant uh, targets uh, to help reach a, a decline and then eventually eliminate roadway deaths. Uh, we mentioned a planning structure, uh, some sort of task force or steering committee for for the action plan itself. You have to take into account uh, equi equity and make sure that there's representation 
uh, from the underserved communities. You have to have uh, a good engagement and collaboration. Uh, you can look at the, the policies and recommend some changes to different policies and, and uh, how we process um, our investments. And of course, you have to have a transparent, publicly available plan. Um, so we surveyed our, our member agencies and we found that most of them had those on the left, but most of them uh, were, were lacking any of the other uh, six elements. So we applied uh, as MPO for a regional safety action plan uh, with the objective of building on all of these existing plans and analyses and filling in the gaps, um, primarily in the unincorporated areas of the county um, to do a systemic safety analysis in those areas, um, have some broad, uh, uh, I'm sorry, some uh, meaningful engagement um, with uh, emphasis on reaching out to the underserved communities. Um, and with the SS4A grant, um, we wanted to build capacity within our own organization to, to identify safety needs and to more effectively invest uh, in projects that will help to reach a, a vision zero goal. Um, we have a, 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 we emphasize safe systems approach. So we understand that, you know, that deaths and serious injuries are unacceptable, um, that humans make mistakes and that we have to be proactive uh, when, we're, when we're thinking of safety and um, incorporating into everything that we're doing with our investments. And of course, uh, we'll have a uh, an action plan that um, all of our uh, member agencies can be captured under making um, at least a subset of their existing projects eligible for implementation under the SS4A. A little bit about what we're doing in Oceano. So touching uh, on the engagement side of, um, of the action plan, uh, the community of Oceano is in unincorporated uh, San Luis Obispo County. It has Highway 1 as the main street here running through, um, uh, dividing it uh, east and west and dividing this, this central part uh, east of Highway 1 from parks and open space west of Highway 1. Uh, it's a diverse community with a lot of uh, Spanish speaking uh, community members, um, and it's uh, diverse in income. We're uh, east of uh, Oceano Elementary School, which is highlighted there in that uh, teal box. Um, are have about sixty or sixty percent uh, of the area's median household income. Um, it's a it's a it's a community that's been surveyed over the years, you know, half a dozen times. Uh, so there's a good understanding already of what Oceano wants to see happen in their community. Uh, and so with this action plan, we're able to formalize um, a lot of the outreach and the survey results into a community and bicycle uh, pedestrian safety action plan. So we're using Cal Berkeley's uh, Safe Trek and Cal Walks Community Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Training Program as a model to carry out some outreach in Oceano. Um, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, so we have a sort of a subset of these SS4A grant um, are these community action plans. So that's what we're creating in, in Oceana. We're using it as a sort of a, a, a test subject um, where we could carry out similar planning activities elsewhere in the community for, you know, safer house to school, or if it's just a community uh, driven um, process to identify their, their bicycle and pedestrian priorities. Um, and that action plan is being led by a steering community, uh, steering committee of community members, as well as the county public works staff and Silcog's rideshare division, who uh, carries out the non-infrastructure side of active transportation and safe routes to school and encouraging uh, more biking and, and providing education uh, on safe bike, bicycling um, habits. Um, <clears throat> we held a community workshop recently. Um, so the, 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 the objective of the workshop was really to uh, educate community members on, you know, what goes into, uh, what factors do we take into account when we are thinking of uh, appropriate bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, we had a Spanish speaking, uh, it's like I said, it's, it's a large Spanish speaking community. We had Spanish language translation, um, which was sort of a magical thing to see the community open up um, when we are uh, what we call here is as serving their food, um, making sure that we aren't um, using a lot of planning jargon and really making it sort of a, a, an, un, an easily understood process. 
Uh, we shared with them some of the uh, demographic information that we take into account when we're thinking of bike and ped facilities. Uh, this is just a comparison of Oceano to San Luis Obispo County um, on a few different factors, both uh, people under age of five and over 65, where they exceed the countywide average, <clears throat> which of course has sort of a bearing on what sort of facilities uh, would make those population groups uh, be able to navigate their community more comfortably. Uh, we looked at <clears throat> their uh, race and ethnicity, as well as uh, spoken language, where they have, uh, as you can see, a high, a high amount of, of Spanish speaking and uh, Hispanic or Latino population. And they also looked at their um, people without health insurance. So, you know, if, if there's any one group that's going to be very impacted by even just one uh, hospital visit, it would be those without insurance. Uh, we looked at the infrastructure. So comparing Oceano Elementary School to six other schools in the same school district in similar built environments, uh, where you can see that Oceano has, as far as ratios, uh, far less uh, miles of sidewalks than they do miles of street within a half mile of the elementary school. <clears throat> uh, we touched back on uh, the surveys that we've uh, conducted, this was a survey back in 2022, uh, where we had about 200 respondents representing about 60% of the kids at the school, at Oceana Elementary School, asking what um, uh, what would make it, or, or what keeps you from walking or biking to school, essentially, where uh, the highest uh, responded um, uh, questions were, were the just safety at intersections, uh, the lack of sidewalks or paths, and speed along uh, the routes near the school. We also shared with them the uh, the collision side of things. So this is probably not uncommon for a lot of smaller regions where uh, there's not a high concentration of collisions at any one location. Um, <clears throat> but we also know that the gaps overall in the pedestrian bicycle network uh, suggests there is some level of risk uh, so one, one thing that we encourage them is that, you know, just because there is not a high level of, of, of crashes in any one location doesn't mean that you don't have a need. Um, that's where we, we, sometimes we get hung up um, on looking at uh, just, I guess, being reactive rather than being pro, proactive in, um, in can, when we're considering bicycle and pedestrian crashes. In terms of um, a little bit, we shared a little bit about the... Uh, ages of of the victims in those crashes where we had actually a lot and the majority of them are, are under 14 or over that 55 to 50, uh, 55 and older range so that thought of uh designing for 8 and 80 was something that we emphasized with them making sure that um if you are designing for people eight or under or 80 and over um you are going to put, produce a, a high quality safe uh, and mobile network um, we also talked about, uh, cause a lot of the community engagement, um, we found that, you know, and this is true elsewhere, I'm sure that not all of the crashes get reported. Um, sometimes you just go straight to the hospital sometimes, especially in, uh, uh, um, community with a high population of Spanish speaking and Latino, uh, community members, you know, not all of those crashes get reported. So one thing that we, uh, walked them through <clears throat> was how to navigate street story and how to share information there. Um, and this was sort of a magical moment as well, uh, because this was presented first in Spanish and then translated into English, um, which had a palpable uh, sort of changing feeling in the room where it was at this point really that the, um, the Spanish speaking community really got engaged and started uh, providing a lot of comments and they just really opened up. So that was a, uh, a cool thing to see. After we shared a little bit about, um, you know, the information that we take into account when we're thinking of appropriate bicycle and pedestrian facilities, um, based on input that we got from public works, as far as, you know, their policies and the state and federal law, when you're, when you're thinking of, you know, what's appropriate in a certain context, um, we gave them a little bit train, a little training of, you know, what might work in their community. So we talked about um, road diets um, and complete streets improvements and where those would work. 
<clears throat> talked about uh, the safety benefits and the application of bike lanes, uh, depending on vehicle speeds and vehicle volumes. And we shared uh, about sidewalks, you know, the safety benefits of sidewalks and, and where are they appropriate. Uh, at the end of the, the, that presentation, um, we took the groups, three different groups out on bike, walk and bikeability assessments. So with that knowledge of, you know, what goes into the decision-making process for certain types of facilities, uh, when it comes to demographics, when it comes to uh, collision history, when it comes to speeds and volumes, and ask them to sort of apply what they had learned on these different locations. <clears throat> After which we came back, we had lunch, one, uh, and we also talked about what they saw. Um, we um, put together, you know, a list of, uh, based on, you know, just where they were going, what are the issues that they saw there? What are the uh, ideas that they would, that they have to, to, to solve those different challenges? Um, so the next steps really with this Oce Oceano uh, Community Action Plan is a uh, prioritized list of recommendations, uh, potentially including pilot projects and other sort of temporary programs and interventions. And the action plan will guide slow COGS investment decisions in Oceano, and it will become a framework for the county's planning updates to their general plan, the circulation element, uh, which is you know, about 43 years old, actually. <clears throat> as far as the, the application itself, um, you know, like I said, I'm in the project delivery division where we do applications all the time, ad nauseum. Uh, this is probably one of the easiest applications that we've ever done. Um, where you might spend the most time really is is filling out those required forms or four required forms. Uh, those uh, as standard forms um, listed there on the right um, and getting into the system, getting into the um, uh, the grant system essentially just to apply takes almost more time probably than actually filling out the the grant application itself. Um, where you would see, I guess, the most work probably in, as far as the, the application outside of the required form is, is just this key information. So outside of, you know, project name, uh, project applicant, you know, um, what your ask is going to be. Uh, there's some a few demographic and crash related questions um, that there's, there's a, in the guide, there's, you know, very clear information about what, how to calculate these different things. But uh, your jurisdiction's population using the 2020 ACS. Uh, the number, the total number of vehicle involved fatalities over five years using the, the fatality analysis reporting system or FARS um, that I'm, I'm sure many are familiar with. And then the um, <clears throat> total average annual fatality rate per 100,000. Um, and I put the, the math equation there too, <laughs> if you want to see that. Um, oops. And the percent of uh, population underserved community census tracts using uh, one of the three methods, one is uh, the USDOT's Equitable Transportation Community Explorer, um, which we'll provide a link to, as well as the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. Uh, but you can also be considered an underserved population uh, or underserved community if you are a rural community. So uh, urban areas or urban clusters uh, with a population of under 200,000. A few tips from the USDOT. Uh, so if you are uh, requesting uh, funds for a new action plan. Um, previous cycle, from what we can tell, all of the action plans were awarded uh, unless they were, you know, ineligible uh, or submitted incomplete applications. So that's, you know, as far as pursuing grants, there's nothing like a guarantee, you know, this is, you know, an almost guarantee. Um, if you, you want to coordinate early on with your jurisdiction before applying, especially if you are applying for, uh, if, especially if you receive funds in 2022 and are applying this cycle for supplemental funds, there's some uh, details there that you'll want to be cognizant of. Um, you can skip the letters of support if you want. Those provide minimal value in the Safe Streets for All action plan or I'm planning a demonstration grant. Uh, make sure your budget and your funding request uh, reflects uh, the effort needed to administer a federal grant where there is, you know, there is reporting. Uh, so you want to be able to work in to your budget time to do that. Uh, remember to do one application per applicant and it's submitted through valid eval, uh, which is sort of different than what we have, you know, previously, most grants, a lot of the grants are, are submitted through grants.gov. Um, 
and be sure to include supplemental planning and demonstration projects in all of your applications. And we'll probably do questions at the very end. We will, thanks. And um, Stephen will also um, send out your information too. Uh, before I jump back into the, the supplemental uh, grants, I just wanted to, um, and thank you for that, Stephen, and in general, the, the overview. Uh, we'll maybe have some follow up with, with how it ties into the, the broader plan to uh, finally get some infrastructure um, improvements in, in Oceano as well, which I know have been um, desired and, 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 and asked for for a long time. Um, I did want to quickly answer a question that's not come through, and I, I, um, I might have completely just skipped over this in the presentation, or maybe the, the slide accidentally didn't make it into my desk. But there was a question about funding share. Um, so there is a uh, the requirements um, for uh, for the grants are uh, it'll be there's a requirement for a twenty percent local match, but in kind contributions can be used. Um, and I'll make sure that for the slides that we post. Um, uh, after this, this webinar is done, I'll make sure that that's included in there. I'm sorry if I glossed over that. Um, also, um, uh, no, uh, no more than 15% of the overall funds in the SS4A program can go to projects in a single state in a given fiscal year. Um, but tribal applications do not count uh towards uh that state's share of the overall funds if that's if that makes sense um so um uh you know that's not to dissuade anybody from applying but they're they're um they can only give uh at most 15 percent to overall applications from from california so there is a kind of competitive slash formula balance to the program but as Stephen said generally like they are uh really looking to um to give out these these uh planning funds uh, the implementation side uh is um a lot more competitive but they're 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 quite uh, solicitous of of, um, of planning applications um currently and what i'm going to do uh as well is now go back in um, and talk about the uh the particular supplemental planning uh application type uh so let me uh, get my uh, screen up. Um, so, uh, Stephen um, just spoke about the, the first category. Um, and as, as I was mentioning before, the supplemental planning is really um, going down into the, the project level um, and maybe singling out some things that were it, that are interaction plan that you know you want to start looking forward with. Um, but uh, you're not quite ready to um, start um, uh, start doing um, some some roots in the ground stuff. So this, um, just like with the action plan, this can be uh, particularly uh, helpful if you um, if you do plan on going for uh, either the state ATP grant or one of the SS4 implementation grants, um, uh, and uh, um, you know, maybe want to make sure about things like like cost estimates and feasibility and all that kind of thing, um, which which I know um, uh, lack of certainty on those elements of it can be a little bit of um, well, it can um, it can discourage uh, some agencies from from go for going all in on an ATP grant. So this is a good way to get a lot of that um, a lot of that pre construction work. Um, out of the way and and um, feel uh, solid on um, on exactly which design um, you're you're going to be doing. Um, so um, you'll see on the left hand uh, side of your screen uh, a lot of the things that Stephen was talking about on the right side. You know, going into some of those um, higher level um, or, or more more not higher level, uh, but but uh, more specific. Um, uh, fit, um, aspects for for particular projects um, that you want to um, that you want to start um, building into reality there. So, uh, and a lot of which you know are included on um, uh, in ATP grants, but you can you can get them done uh, through through this grant here. So, pre construction engineering, um, right of way acquisition. I know it, um, a lot of agencies are, are quite relieved to get those kinds of things out of the way uh, before going uh, full on in, in, in ATP um permitting and the like um and these are the kinds of um activities that are supported um by that uh that supplemental planning uh grant type um so a lot of the the road safety 
audits, um, things like what Stephen was talking about, but additional, if you maybe want to have a sort of a sub plan or a complementary plan to your action plan, um, uh, maybe for a particular neighborhood, if your if your action plan is covering an entire city, something like that, um, getting uh, a little bit more solid um, data um, and um, uh, progress reporting um, uh, on implementation. Um, uh, if um, if maybe you've got a plan on the books and um, want to start documenting exactly uh, which um, which aspects of it are starting to show uh, real results on the ground. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, feasibility studies uh, with uh, some quick build strategies, um, um, uh, basically, uh, as, as you, I'm sure you probably mostly know what quick build is, uh, what quick build projects are like, but, you know, these are meant to be low cost demonstration things, temporary, um, maybe, maybe in the action plan that you've developed, um, you've identified that there's going to be some kind of bike infrastructure in a particular corridor, but you know exactly what the design is isn't called for, and you want to pilot a few different, uh, um, few different options um, with your community. And so this is a way to to put down something that's you know not totally permanent, but can can capture what the sort of lived experience with with an infrastructure project. Uh, different kinds of infrastructure design will be, um, and um, and you can use this opportunity to obviously get your your community's um, uh, uh, reaction to to which designs are, are most popular, and also see which ones um, are are um, creating the biggest uh, safety improvements. Um, part of the deliverables uh, for the supplemental planning will be not just, of course, doing these demonstrations, but but showing that you assess the benefits. Um, so, uh, if you go with any of these, these uh, feasibility studies or, or pilot programs, um, you will have to, uh, as well, uh, when, um, when your grant report is, is due, um, uh, incorporate all of, of the data and the pedestrian accounts and all the community feedback before and after photos. Um, if this is all looking familiar um, from the ATP grant, um, well, that's because it is. Um, this, um, these uh, are are uh, are all um, uh, the kinds of data that are are used in the public engagement and um, and uh, safety improvement sections of an ATP grant. This is a really a sort of a perfect pay on the federal government's dime to um, to get a lot of that um, uh, a lot of that uh, work done. Uh, it's really some of the most time consuming. Um, parts of an ATP application um, and being able to do it uh, with federal support. Um, so we really want to highlight uh, the synergy between uh, these grants here and and um, and putting yourselves in prime position for for a very competitive uh, uh, state program and, and one um, where this kind of background work um, um, can can often be seen as a barrier to applying in the first place. So it's a great way to, to set yourself up, especially if you're a, a smaller um, Understaffed, uh, under-resourced, under-resourced community. Um, uh, so um, this is again just kind of delineating the um, the uh, the difference between um, some of the supplemental uh, activities um, and and um, project level planning um, in the um, in the grant types and. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, final deliverables uh, for um, for the supplemental planning uh, grants would be um, uh, the kind of action plan um, that is funded in the action plan section, but also uh, the updates to that from uh, maybe looking at um, sort of re-evaluating it or, or evaluating it more specifically through an equity framework, um, maybe uh, taking or updating your visions or action plans on the complete streets plan, which um, demonstrating specific corridors and things like that, which are targeted for priority investments. Um, and uh, as mentioned before, the um, the community feedback um, uh, and the like. Uh, USDOT has webinars specifically about the actual application process for this. Stephen mentioned it. it's pretty straightforward, uh, certainly. A lot, uh, a lot more straightforward than um, than some uh, competitor programs uh, that you may be familiar with here. But there are 
um, uh, webinars going separately on on each of uh, on each of these grant types, as well as um, the actual nitty gritties of, of the application process uh, on the DOT website. Um, the links right there. Um, and just to you know reiterate, um, uh, this is uh, really uh, we kind of see uh, the uh, particular promise for the state station and roads for all program um, um, as kind of filling a little bit of, of a gap or a barrier that a lot of communities need to find a way to get over to even um, be in a position to go for ATP funds. Um, uh, ATP does support plans, but they haven't been um, scoring as well um, in, in recent cycles. So if you don't have a plan in the books and we're hoping to get one through ATP and they have maybe felt stymied, um, uh, or discouraged in that aspect, uh, here's another option for doing it. Um, and, um, you know, it really sets you up uh, uh, extremely well um, uh, to, to be more competitive for, for infrastructure project, either, you know, in state level funding or as we'll discuss in a, in a further webinar uh, on the implementation side of, of this SS40 grant as well. Um, so uh, with that, we'll conclude um, more or less on schedule, uh, I, I hope, um, and um, we'll answer some questions here live. Uh, and also, you can feel free to uh, contact me or uh, Stephen with any uh, anything else that comes to mind after we're done. I'll also give a quick plug. Um, we will be um, announcing uh, or we'll be releasing a request for proposals for our, our uh, next cycle of uh, ATP technical assistance, uh, where we really work uh, in great detail over the long term with communities and preparing ATP grants. Um, we're, we've been waiting to see a little bit um, what the end result of budget negotiations is and, and how that affects um, the size of ATP cycle seven before uh, releasing that. So uh, we may be looking at uh, maybe even uh, some, some partnerships that would carry over um, uh, beyond um, beyond the cycle eight, if that's something that um, that matches either your community's timeline or um, or the particular size um, and eligible projects in, in cycle eight. So please stay tuned for that announcement. Um, it should be coming uh, hopefully when we get clarity within the next uh, month or so. Um, so I'll go into the Q and A. Uh, there is uh, this is more of I'm seeing an announcement from uh, California OTS, uh, just asking actually that, um, uh, oh, uh, I'm not sure if everybody can see the Q&A on your end or if that's only available for uh, for the hosts to see, uh, but there is a, um, there's an announcement about an OTS uh, survey, call to action survey uh, with a link to that. Um, so I will uh, make sure that gets distributed as well to the participants um, in the survey here. And um, I will put the link for that survey as well in the chat. So, oh, thanks, Diana already beat me to it. So if you can't see other people's questions in the Q&A, uh, we'll just put the link to that survey in the, the chat and a little bit of background to it as well. Uh, thank you, Angela, for uh, letting us know about, um, about that opportunity. Um, Loretta asks, must a simple application to update action plans um, include supplemental planning and demonstration activities? Uh, if I understand your question correctly, um, yes, yeah, so there is the flow chart. Um, whoops, uh, I'll see if I can pull it up. Uh, I'll have to uh, thumb through to get it. I don't remember exactly which slide it was, but there was a flow chart basically saying which grant is is right for you, and it'll be uh, on the slides when we when we distribute them as well. Um, basically, delineating sort of like if you if you do not have an action plan, a comprehensive action plan, um, go for that one. If you do have one um, and you want to update it, um, the the examples that I mentioned earlier. Um, or, for example, you, maybe you have a Vision Zero plan on the book and you want to update it with a particular uh, sub plan or addendum of a complete streets plan or a safe process school plan or something like that. 
then that would be what you would use the supplemental planting um, and demonstration uh, form for. In terms of whether or not it has to have those activities, Okay, I, as I'm reading through your question again, I think I, I I think I'm understanding a little bit more what what you're trying to get at. Um, then my understanding is yes, it would. Um, and the idea is that your your um, uh, your uh, sort of using it as a little bit of an intermediate step um, uh, between or or as a way to kind of uh, bridge the gap, no pun intended, between um, uh, the action plan that you have on a book and something that you're ready to go for on uh, on an implementation grant. So I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, I can further answer more. You can either maybe clarify or I can uh, answer more uh, uh, by email for going after that. Um, if you not meet the deadline, will all the opportunity arrive um, but after July 10th? Yes, this is, uh, this is right every fiscal year. Um, uh, so there have already been a couple rounds uh, that have uh, that have cycled through. Uh, the notice of funding opportunities uh, have consistently been posted in February, March. Um, but you know, again, um, as you've mentioned, it um, and from other people I've spoken to as well, uh, it it's a it's an application. Um, Will be probably more straightforward and and uh, um, so uh, you know we definitely encourage you to to um, to try to make that July tenth deadline, but it is not the last opportunity. No. And I don't see any more questions, um, so I think we'll get ready to close out. I want to again uh, thank Stephen uh, for joining us. Um, we will send the slides, which are have our um, have our uh, contact information on it, uh, um, and thanks as well to, uh, for um, helping with um, helping uh, with tech. Um, and please uh, let us know how um, how you just decide to pursue uh, SS4A and um, and uh, how it's working out in, in your communities. We look forward to uh, seeing you on the next one of these about implementation grants um, and uh, working with some of you, we hope, uh, on, um, on uh, going for the ATP when that, when that comes available. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon.